Good afternoon. I'd love to see all of this group here. I appreciate everybody being interested enough to actually show up for a for a, a alphabet soup presentation <laughs> of acronyms from government programs here. Um, and usually by the time I get through all these presentations, it's kind of a, everybody's kind of stupefied by the sheer mass of information plus all the acronyms out there, which is why I decided it'd be a really good idea to give you a cheat sheet to be able to take home with you. So this has not only a description of each of the programs, what the eligible land is, which organization, as far as uh, either NRCS, which is the Natural Resources Conservation Service, a new name for the Oil Soil, Soil Conservation Service, what the Farm Service Agency actually deals with. And then on the very back, you're going to see a whole series of different websites where you can go for additional information. Okay? And the one thing I didn't put on there, and should have, is my contact information. Okay, <laughs> and because uh, you're very, very welcome to call me, my phone number is area code 254-718-7684. That's a daytime phone. I turn it off at five. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so uh, and my my email is chuck dot spelled that same way at tpwd so Texas Parks and Wildlife Department dot texas dot gov. Okay. You're free to contact me if you have any questions at all. All right. So why are we actually talking about farm bill programs? Well, really, there's a big dog in the room as far as money for conservation for, uh, conservation funding is concerned in Texas. This, giving you an idea, this is 2011 numbers, but it, it's, the percentages are, are pretty much the same today. The uh, North American Waterfowl Grant which has done so much tremendous work for putting, uh, restoring wetlands everywhere and bouncing those, uh, those waterfowl numbers up. If you've seen some of the presentations today, it's $2 million a year in Texas. Partners for Fish and Wildlife. So the uh, Fish and Wildlife Services Partners Program is $2 million a year. State Wildlife Grants, which is Parks and Wildlife funded uh, non-game work in Texas is $2 million a year, okay. Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson, that's the money that we get from federal excise taxes on sporting goods and firearms uh, is about $17 million each, and that matches up with about $91 million that Parks and Wildlife gets in hunting and fishing license fees and other fees, okay? That compares to $354 million in money that went directly into landowners' pockets to do conservation work from federal farm bills in, in 2011. So that gives you an idea of what the, why we talk about farm bill when we're talking about conservation efforts here in Texas. Okay, so let's discuss some of the different programs that are available out there. I'm going to try and key them in on native grassland, uh, hiking hike benefit native grasslands with them. The first, the biggest program we have in Texas is the Conservation Reserve Program. It comes in three different flavors. Basically, uh, it, uh, its main purpose is to uh, remove highly erodible or environmentally sensitive land from production, or at least that was true up until this year. Uh, it's taken on an additional purpose this year. But the three forms are general CRP, in which they enroll entire farm fields into production and put a, a, a cover crop on them, a permanent cover crop, typically grass. Continuous CRP, which targets the most environmentally sensitive areas, like where water flows off a field into a stream. Uh, and now this year the new CRP Grasslands program, which is a working program. This is a, a, a program where somebody who has a, a, a livestock operation uh, can actually enroll it in CRP, continue to use it as a livestock operation, but they have to meet certain environmental standards. And in return they get an annual payment. So. Each of these have different rule, rules and regulations. The one fun thing about <coughs> federal programs is there's, there's no such thing as free money. Anytime you, you sign a deal with the government, you're agreeing to do something in, in exchange for that money, and they'll hold you accountable for it. Okay? And they also have all sorts of rules and regulations <coughs> uh, concerning eligibility for these different programs. That's what we're going to talk about quite a bit today. So on this general CRP where you're enrolling highly erodible whole crop lands, uh, you can only enroll during announced sign-ups, and they hold them at irregular periods. Well, right now, we're going to 
fire up our next sign up starting on December 1st and going through February 20, February 26th of next year. And we probably won't see another one for several years. So that's kind of an important set of dates to remember. New sign ups require a cost share admit contract management operation. In other words, in the old days, we planted grass and we walked away from for it for the 10 year length of the contract. And the landowner collected a yearly payment for 10 years and didn't have to do anything except watch that grass grow. But nowadays, we're trying to get more environmental benefit out of that CRP. So we require that the landowners go in there and do uh, mid-contract management disturbances. That could be interseeding, it could be burning, okay? They have to do something to maintain the health and vigor of that place. Uh, government programs don't necessarily always make a whole lot of sense, okay? And in this particular case, probably the best thing that you could do on a grassland CRP like this would be to be able to go in and graze it every once in a while. Grazing can reinvigorate a grassland, and it's often necessary for it. Well, in this, if you happen to do that, you can use that as a mid-contract management practice, but they charge you 25% of your, your yearly annual rate, rental rate, to do that. Doesn't make any sense. They'll cost share other big contract management practices. If you want to go out there and burn it, they'll cost share it. But if you want to grave it, they'll charge you for it. And they figure that's because you're getting some economic benefit off of it. And they, the government doesn't want to give you anything for free. Remember? Okay. All right. Doesn't make sense, but that's just basically one of those things you have to worry about. All right. They provide 50% of the cost share for that cover establishment. They give you an annual rental rate for 10 years. They do have a 25% acreage cap. As far as that, what, that, what they're talking about there is that only 25% of the cropland in the county can be converted to CRP. And once they reach that 25% acreage cap, they won't enroll any more land in that county. And the idea behind that was to, so you didn't wipe out the seed dealers, the fertilizer guys, the equipment dealers, and everything else. If you took out all of the farmland in the county, you're going to impact, economically impact some of the folks that, that live and work out there or have uh, businesses out there. Now there are counties that no land should have ever been broken to start with, and they, you know, they, they struggle to, to uh, they should probably put it all back into CRP, but it, that's just how life goes. Applicants compete nationally against each other, so when you put in a, an application for a general CRP contract, you're actually competing against every other farmer out there who, I, who puts in a contract application during that enrollment sign period. And what they do is they rank them according to an environmental benefits index, that's that EBI. And the environmental benefit index looks at soil, what, how much soil quality you're, you're saving, how much air quality you're preserving, how much water quality or quantity you're, you're preserving, and how much wildlife benefits you're, you're preserving. Because wildlife is a co equal resource concerned with soil and water under CRP. Okay. So, oh, hold on a second. So, use of native plants or pollinator plants can actually boost your ranking scores, okay? Helping at-risk species can boost your ranking store, scores, and then benefiting air and water quality can also provide extra ranking points in this environmental benefit <coughs> index, okay? In Texas, we've set aside certain areas as priority areas. <coughs> air quality, wildlife, and water. And you can see in the panhandle, some of those counties actually get points for each, all three of them, and those points stack. In other words, if you get 10 points for one, for each one, you can get 30 points if you're in a county that has stacked benefits up there. All right. Again, some of those counties, especially over here, probably should never have been broken out. They're all sandy and they blow away as soon as the wind starts to blow. So obviously, we're trying to do some work with them. You'll also notice that there's a small cluster of counties down here in South Texas that have wildlife benefits. We're trying to do some ocelot work down there. Okay. The rest of the lesser prairie chicken? Got a lot of lesser prairie chicken up in the north, exactly, as far as wildlife is concerned. This will give you an idea exactly where the general enroll, CRP enrollment falls out in the United States. You can see that the, the Great Plains contains an awful lot of it, especially Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma Panhandle, Western Kansas, Eastern Oklahoma, Eastern Colorado, etc. When you get east of the Mississippi River, most of that CRP went into trees. And when you get into that band, through southern Georgia and up the eastern seaboard, a lot of it, it was put into pine trees. And right now we're trying to convert those from loblolly pine trees to longleaf pine trees, the more native, the, the native, more native pine tree that was originally there. Okay. Okay. Um, the 
second version is continuous CRP. It has year-round sign-up. That means you can sign up anytime you want. We're targeting the most environmentally sensitive lands, and I apologize for the, how dark the, this slide is in here. Okay. Uh, the idea is to protect water quality, such as with buffers and filter strips, protect air quality with shelter belts and wind trap strips. That's the thing that traps dirt as, they, as it flows across the field. You actually have grass strips planted out there. Protect the declining uh, grassland wildlife, including lesser prairie chickens, mottled ducks, ocelots, and other upland birds. Okay. We have a special version of this called State Acres for Wildlife Enhancement, or SAFE. Remember, the government loves acronyms. You notice that the, the wildlife is silent in this one? But anyway, <coughs> even though it's a wildlife enhancement project, program, CP means conservation practices. So this is conservation practice number 38. What's really one, interesting about this is that it's a locally, where most of the stuff is pushed down from the national office, but CP38s are actually generated at the local level. Groups get together and decide on an environmental issue that they have and how they want to go about solving it. Okay, and it's usually focused around uh, an threatened or endangered species or, in some cases, habitat. What's it requires a partnership component and monitoring components. They want to actually see if what you find will happen when you put in this habitat does happen. And they require you pay for the monitoring, by the way. Okay. Now, it pays a sign-up incentive payment. That's the SIP. A sign-up incentive payment is $10 per acre per year contract. So a 10-year contract gets $100 an acre sign-up incentive payment. A 15-year contract gets $150 an acre sign up incentive payments, so $10 an acre a year contract. It also provides 50% cost share for installation of eligible practices and 40% practice incentive payments. So in other words, after that practice is successfully installed, let's say a native prairie restoration planting, you get 50% cost share to put it in. Once it's successfully installed, you get another 40%. In other words, 90% cost share, okay? plus maintenance and annual rental payments for up to the 15, 15 years of the, of the contract. And the, the annual rental payments are based on soil. So the better the soil you have, the higher your rental payment. Poor quality soils like up in the Panhandle, maybe $26 an acre. River bottomland soils, maybe $80 an acre. Okay, every year for 10 years to 15 years. Okay, we actually have initiated three different safe projects. We did it when the program first came out in 2008. They include lesser prairie chickens in Panhandle, Atwater prairie chicken, uh, model bucks here on the coast, and ocelots in South Texas. So lesser prairie chickens began as a $14 million program, whereas the idea was to create 20,000 acres of native grassland vegetation to create corridors between isolated populations of chickens that reconnect those populations. Okay. Major partners were Farm Service Agency, NRCS, Parks and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife, PNC, and Filex Joint Venture. We currently have 90,000 acres enrolled. We started off with, we asked for 20,000 acres. It was so successful, I had to keep going back and asking for more acres. What a shame. We now have 150,000 acre allocation. I expect to have that signed up within a year. Okay, so instead of, hold on a second. So instead of, can you go back one? Trying to. <laughs> Trying to. Okay, don't worry about it. So instead of $14 million, we are now spending $63 million on this, this project so far. And it'll probably be close to $100 million by the time we get 150,000 acres. I'm trying to connect there through Randall and Armstrong County? Is that what you're trying to do? Isolated populations within those programs. Isolated populations within the purple spots. The reason that there's gaps in between is those are heavily, heavily farmed areas. That's cotton country yeah, okay. in between. The, um, obviously, on the, just outside the state line, the purple splotch would extend into New Mexico. And yes, New actually, it does, it does extend into New Mexico. It extends into Oklahoma, including the Panhandle and, and the uh, western part. So you're coordinating with, with, the, with those states with, to, for allocation of these funds? As far as the state money is concerned, this is a Texas version of it. Those states have their own versions. And, but there's no, is there no working together? Yes, yeah, so we states? are working together on it. Okay, but we are, but. Yeah, Playa Lakes Joint Ventures is actually a five-state cooperation. Exactly. So, 
we are working together on it. And this is this this safe project for lesser prairie chickens is on top of NRCS's Equip Lesser Prairie Chicken uh, initiative as well, and the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Lesser Prairie Chicken work. We actually started doing Equip work for prairie chickens in 2003. I think we were a little ahead of the curve there as far as things are concerned. Okay. Here's one that really frustrates me. We created one for mongrel ducks and atwater prairie chickens. Does this country look familiar for some of you guys? <laughs> the idea was to restore 11,500 acres of native prairie and shallow water wetlands on the Gulf Coast prairie. FSA agreed to put up $15.3 million for it. You notice it extends into, into Louisiana. This was a cross-state line one. It actually, actually, when it finally finalized, because it's so difficult to coordinate between two states, we split it up. And they actually withdrew their part of their safe project. They did it with a, a, a different program. Okay, But we currently have zero acres enrolled. 90% cost share on prairie restoration. 15 years worth of payments. Okay, $150 an acre sign-up incentive folks. Bonus, and I couldn't get a single acre signed up in Texas. They started off with 11,000 acres, and because this has been going since 2008, they pulled it back to 500 acres. They kept cutting it and moving those acres to other places that were using it. Okay, why didn't it happen? When we wrote it, rice prices were down. These are a working lands program. You can't just put this on a, a cattle ranch, this has to be a, a farm. Okay. Rice prices went up after it came out. So folks who were interested in it before, when we were writing it, suddenly became a lot less interested in it. All right. So this is still available. Folks, this is still available. Sure, we've got 500 acres. Don't worry about it. You sign up that 500 acres, I'll get you 5,000 more. Okay. They've got it. We've got to show the interest. Okay. So, so, Chuck, you can continue to farm rice? No. No, you can't. In that particular case, you, you're restoring native, native prairie and wetland complex. So you're taking right, you're taking cropland out of production. It has to have been farmed for the last six years. You're taking cropland out of production, you're putting it into native prairie wetland restoration. So if you can think of some folks out there that have current farming operations and want to convert them over to native prairie, maybe do some restoration of the wetlands on them, we can give them money. Okay. Does it have to have been rice? No, it any kind. Any kind of yeah, it could be any kind of farming. Yeah. Okay, any, anything that, that the Farm Service Agency lists as, as, as current crop lands. Okay. It could be corn. Okay. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay. Ocelots, I'm just throwing this up here real quick because we're grassland folks in here and they're trying to introduce brush. Okay. <laughs> Don't leave the thorn scrub. Um, but they've been relatively successful. We, we set it up to 5,000 acres. They've enrolled almost 2,000 acres during that time period. But it's been a little bit slow getting started. One interesting thing I wanted to let you know about this was they spent a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to restore native thorn scrub down there, only to have it swallowed up by invasive species of grass. Okay, they're down in, of course, the Rio Grande Valley area. Lots and lots of really nasty, you know, Kogon and all that kind of nasty grass down there. I mean, as soon as you got the bare ground out there, it wants to invade into it. The most successful projects that I saw put in planting thorn scrub down here were ones that were general CRP fields planted native grass first. After the native grass was established, they came back in and started putting native shrubs <laughs> into the native grass fields. The native grass kept being Basis, the exact species out. Otherwise, TNC was spending $700 an acre on specialized herbicides to try and control that, thing, that exotic grass without killing the thorn scrub. Okay, so native grass does wonderful things for all sorts of reasons. Okay. All right. All right. Another program we have is conservation practice number 33: habitat buffers for upland birds. So let's say you don't want to convert an entire field, or you couldn't convince the landowner you're working with to convert an entire field. But what about the, the edges of that field, the buffers around it? 
Let's say you've got a tree line there. If you've got a tree line in a cropland field, you want to guess how much production you get close to those trees? Practically nothing. Those tree roots are underneath the, that part of the cropland field. They're sucking down the, any of the, the water, the nutrients, and everything else. They're shading out that part of the field, depending on how they're aligned with, you know, uh, uh, if they're creating sh uh, shady areas on that thing. So what about putting in a 30 to 120 foot wide native grass buffer? Doesn't have to be all the way around the cropland. It can be just on one side, two sides, however much you want to do, okay? Again, it pays that $100 to $150 an acre sign of incentive payment, 50% cost share, 40% practice incentive payment, and an annual rental rate. So that if you can't go big and you can go small, here's a way to do it, okay? Requires periodic management. That could be burning, that could be disking, that could be interceding with additional species, okay? And as a new emphasis on pollinator habitat, everybody's getting into the uh, bandwagon on that, okay? So it did requ require quail and grassland bird population monitoring the first few years. We got them all taken care of. And guess what? When you plant them, they do come, okay? That's not too surprising. So here in Texas, it was really interesting. We monitored the bird populations all across the southeast. In the first year or two, in, the, in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, whatever, the populations dropped and went up quickly on, on quail and other grassland birds. In Texas, our, our reference acres compared to our, our monitored acres, they were showing about the same for the first two or three years. It was about year three and four when that grass finally got established well that they really bounced up. Now, it just takes us a little bit longer to get things done in some places around here, okay? Most of our CP33 acres were done up in the, in the uh, uh, Abilene area, so much drier. And it took longer for those bumpers to get, get established, okay? Recently, we got a modification made to this particular program where we can now enroll <coughs> irrigated crop circle corners. Ah! Hey, if we can't get big acres, we'll get little acres, right? Okay. So starting in January, we can now install <coughs> crop circle corners in CP33. Same $100 to $150 acre sign of incentive payment, 90% cost share, 15 years of annual rental payments. And those are in corners where the guys don't have enough water to water those corners, and so it's always a, a source of irritation. Now they have 15 years of payment coming in, and you're growing your native grass out. Okay. Texas jumped on us like a June bug. 8,000 acres have been enrolled nationally, 5,000 of them here in Texas. Okay. So, <clears throat> they know it's a good deal. All right. CRP Grassland is a brand new program. It's the Working Lands Program. They set aside 2 million acres of the 24 million acre national allocation of CRP for this Working Grassland Program. You can use it for grazing, haying, or seed harvest, okay? Have you ever tried to figure out a way to have to preserve that prairie remnant so you can get the seeds from it and still provide that landowner with some income? What about this? Okay. In other words, you can use that entirely for seed for a seed harvest if you want to. You can roll that land for seed harvest, okay? Eligible land cannot currently have an equip, uh, an easement on it. Sorry, Mary. Okay? Or equip or CSP lifespan contract. So if, they, if they've already got a contract on there that's, that's set up doing something, then, then you can't enroll that. It does require an NRCS conservation plan. It includes best primary nesting season deferment. And that might be a little bit tough when we're talking about native seed harvest. We'll probably have to work with NRCS on that a little bit. But it provides fifteen dollars an acre per year, and that landowner continues to be able to use that land with some restrictions on it. And our CF has to follow the NRCS conservation plan, and it may have a uh, nesting season deferment. This one, landowners will be competing na nation nationally using an EBI, yeah. that environmental, be uh, environmental benefit index, and no cropping history is required. But there's a very limited sign up that ends November. The first one is. November 20th, less than a week away, or a week away, next Friday. Okay, you have to get on it pretty quick. Okay, now, the upper right-hand corner is basically what the grassland rental rates are around the United States for this particular program. I realize that most of the folks in this room are from Texas, but I know that we may occasionally, we may have some folks in here from other parts of the United States. You can see that the highest rental rates are up in that uh, 
corn growing country, Iowa, Nebraska, et cetera. Now, when we take a look at the environmental benefits index, one of the uh, point values for extra points is threat of conversion. And the green shaded counties are considered the highest rate of threat of conversion. Does that look a bit familiar? Okay. All right. And South Valley and a few other places. I'm not exactly sure why they're worried so much about Abilene, but okay. And the second thing is uh, get, get 20 extra points there and 10 extra points uh, in the blue, blue shaded area. So if you're working in those next of the woods, there's some extra points available for you for, you for this particular program. And then we also set aside certain uh, grassland areas. And if there's any quail folks in here, yes, I do work on the quail committee. So guess what? My quail county's got some extra points. All right. <clears throat> As you'll see over there in, on, on that particular map. So you move over to Waller County. You're just missing us. <laughs> just missing you here and there. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't, that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply, OK? All right. EQIP is the next program we're going to be talking about. This one's run by NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's a working lands program. It's basically got a livestock emphasis. 60% of the money is supposed to go to livestock. Its main purpose is to reduce serious threats to soil, water, and related natural resources. And believe it or not, it includes wildlife. Okay. And Texas's share is 70 to $80 million a year. At least 5% of that funding has to be dedicated to wildlife. And in Texas, that means three and a half to four million dollars dollars a year. Okay. Typically, how equip funding is split up in this state is in two pots. A state, uh, well, three pots really. You've got a state uh, uh, statewide resource set of allocations, and this shows last year how that statewide resource that were allocated last year. The orange and green were for wildlife, uh, native grassland restoration areas. But even the others, like the, the yellows and others, are for water quality. And there's nothing better than, than native grass for water, for water quality issues. So there's no reason that you couldn't get equipped money, even in those areas, for water quality. Okay. Um, uh, a little bit of closer look at the Bob White Quail area. Four year plan, partners pledged seven to almost eight million dollars in pledges. Uh, and uh, the idea was to restore 255,000 acres of native grass. See, we don't shoot small, okay? A quarter million, you know, acres at a time here. All right. Now for NRCS, just to give you an idea, one on, on first year for FY15, uh, they did 10 contracts on about 14,000 acres for a half a million dollars. The partners uh, did a whole lot better. Okay. 65 contracts, more than NRCS paid, and on about three times the amount of acres. And there's a reason for that. I won't get into politics. We're going to try and solve that. So we're going to flip these numbers next year. Okay. Uh, if you're from West Texas, and we're also working on, on pronghorn and antelope uh, grassland restorations out there. That's brush removal. Uh, range receding, uh, basically some deferment out there, especially during the fawning season, so there's a little bit of grass to cover up those fawns when the coyotes are wandering around. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the and we're also doing, uh, we're also moving pronghorn from uh, the Panhandle down to West Texas because they were severely impacted by the drought and the loss of grasslands out there. So as we improve the grasslands, we're moving antelope down to restock those areas. So. The partner's share is $235,000, and NRCS put, put close to $400,000 uh, $400, out there. We're also doing fence modifications, believe it or not. That's because it's old sheet net wire fence out there, and the animal won't cross them. So we're actually either replacing or pinning up that, those uh, net wire fences so that the animal are able to move uh, across range, ranges. Now, we also have national initiatives. And that includes, that's focusing on the native grassland <coughs> habitat restoration. And in this particular case, lesser prairie chickens, somebody asked me earlier about whether or not we did cross uh, state work with prairie chicken, and we did. So with EQIP, we've got one working on Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado. Okay. And for FY15, NRCS basically worked on improving all 15,000 acres of native grass. So and since 2010, oh, yeah. half a million acres. Okay. Not all planting, a lot of times it's <coughs> brush, uh, doing better grazing management, and 
and basically improving the diversity of the grasslands out there. There's also an Oglala initiative going on out there. Basically, if you don't know it, the largest aquifer in the United States is the Oglala aquifer. It, it spreads from uh, Nebraska south to Texas. About a third of the agricultural production in the United States is based on water pumped out of that aquifer. And it's getting pumped out faster than it's recharging because it's a fairly dry area of the United States. The idea is to reduce the amount of water getting pumped out in a variety of different ways. And one of the ways is, or two of the ways that might interest us, is planting non-irrigated permanent vegetation. In other words, converting cropland to grassland. Okay? And, or basically also thinking about using uh, native grass in ways for grazing hay and land wildlife like that. NRCS came out with a uh, monarch initiative, announced it yesterday, $4 million available, conserving and enhancing diverse native plant communities. I want to show you what the... <coughs> NRCS identified the highest potential for gains in habitat to be on private grazing lands, particularly in sites supporting native grass. Conversion from introduced monocultures to species rich native grasslands will be a high priority. So here we've got $4 million, $4 million. We've got 10 states that we're going to be focusing on. Texas is one of them. And the idea is let's convert and introduce grasses to natives. Okay? State grants. Well, we've got a recipient of the state grant here in the room with Jim Willis in the back. He's, he'll be coming up next. Basically, it's to stimulate innovation in ag production. And so we've got things like pastures for upland birds that Tim Sigmund talked about next door a minute ago, which was a SIG grant, education grant uh, recipient. And Jim's demonstrating the potential for economic benefit of native grass restoration work that was done. And one for this year is basically looking at integrating pollinator and plant associations to have that requirements for southern high plains. So if you're a researcher out there, there is farm bill money available to help you with research. It has to benefit ag production, but it can also benefit wildlife and, and natural restorations. Okay. Ag conservation easement programs. You may not know it, but they're also into the preserving farm, land, farm and ranch land into for future generations. And it, one of the really nice things is that with a new farm bill, typically NRCS puts in half <coughs> the cost for an ag easement. Okay. But they can put up to 75% of the fair market value <coughs> for grasslands of special environmental significance. Mm -hmm. And the landowner can contribute the other 25%. The biggest problem that land trusts have in Texas is they're cash poor. And it costs money to be involved in a program like this because normally NRC has to fix the trust to put up 50%. So here's Grasslands of special significance has a break out there, but we probably still need to find donors out there to come up with the additional money that's needed, okay? All right. The land trust are basically, they set the conditions so they have to follow within certain guidelines. So if you want to be a native grassland restoration, focus on your trust, you can do it, okay? All right. So we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, I've got a few, but I'll tell you what. Go ahead and skip the, the Weather Reserve Program. Conservation Stewardship Program. This is one that farmers and ranchers have, and they can get extra money and extra points if they're actually working a few extra things. And these are the best land sewers out there. They're already doing good things on our land. And our sales give them some extra money if they do things like prairie restoration, pollinator habitat, okay? Small openings in forests. Anybody in here a pocket? Pocket prairie person in forest land, okay, you can actually get some equip funding for that. And prescribed burning and short duration grazing, so better management. All right. And you can wrap all these programs together in a partnership, so including an easements portion of it, a, uh, all sorts of, you know, you can uh, easement and equip and other programs all together if, if partners get together and come up with a source of about 50% of the funding. And you can tweak the rules on it, too, their program. So some of the rules that they have currently don't work very well for you. If you come up with one of these 
RCPPs, Resource Conservation Partnership Programs, you can actually get them to change some of the rules a little bit. You can't get them to change it much, but they, they do help speak. Okay. All right. So uh, for those of you who, who came in after first started talking, there's a, a handout where he's enumerated uh, and, and he mystified a lot of these programs. If you'd like a copy of this, please grab one and also uh, pick these here a little bit too uh, about these programs. But we're going to take about uh, a five minute, uh, set, uh, a seven minute break. We'll start at 25 minutes.